How do you make a mouse? Uh, nah, not a very good mouse. And the only other mouse I can think of is Mickey Mouse ears, but let's not do that. That's, uh, that's just, uh, we can't, can't do anything with poor Mickey. That would, that would be... <laughs> but, but here's the mouse. And again, just take some time here. I know I always take time and tell silly stories here I go, but but I because I really want you to stop and think about it. Don't don't just dive into the question yet. You can avoid a lot of mistakes with a good physical picture of what's going on. So draw the picture, think about it. And, and so in this case, I'm thinking here, okay, what's gonna happen now when the mouse gets free? Does it does it fall straight down? Okay, good. You got that physical picture. This is an important step because if without it you will do your calculations completely wrong. You will write out your math equations correct for the wrong physical picture and you'll do your math right but you'll still get the wrong answer because you haven't done the physics right. You can do the math right but that's only half the problem. You got to get that physical picture and this mouse does not drop straight down. The whole lesson of this chapter is that the X and Y components behave independently. And so whatever horizontal speed the mouse had when it worked free, it keeps that same horizontal speed. But then it begins to fall. So it doesn't fall straight down. It makes this path, as we said, a parabola. And so this would probably be the motion of the mouse if you were standing on the ground watching the mouse. What would be the motion of the hawk looking at this description? Yeah, well, it says the hawk continues on for two seconds. Now, I'm not sure how far it would go in my picture, so I, I'm not saying my, my, my picture is drawn to scale here, but I'll draw it about this far. I'll say, look, this was where it would be when time is one second after it got loose, and this is where it would be after it got two seconds, and my bird is even looking worse. But there is the, the two seconds, some, somewhere. Where would the mouse be at this point? Right. So from the viewpoint of the bird here, the hawk, it's going to be at that, that, that same point. Again, at least without air friction. Uh, by the way, when this comes to military operations, if you drop a bomb out of a plane, where is it when it hits the ground? Right under the plane. <laughs> <laughs> right under the plane without air friction. So if you've ever n seen like the military channel or the history channels and they got all these pictures of the low flying plane F4s and their Vietnam runs. Have you ever watched the bombs that they drop at a low altitude? You got those like little parachute thing out the back so the bomb comes out, parachute opens up, then what happens? air friction gets it behind because the last thing you want to be is close to the ground and then going off right under underneath you. If you're high enough up I guess it doesn't matter you know if this is World War II and you're bombing Berlin and you know so they go off right under you. You're 30,000 feet you know they're you know they're not that big of a bomb. Now I guess if it's an atomic bomb there was another big challenge. I, I, if, you, yeah, if you studied that one that one what, if the, what they did there is they were flying at a high rate of speed, drop it. They're so high, it was well over a minute before it hit the ground. So what do you do? Turn around at that point, right? And so if you're going, say, 500 miles an hour that way, I don't know if they were going that, but let's say 400 miles an hour. But if you're going 400 miles an hour that way, then you drop it, you turn around. Now you're going 400 miles that way, they're going, four, the bomb's going 400 miles that way. And... Uh, it must have been a tough mission to volunteer for because nobody knew like, if they were coming back. It's like, well, how big is this? You know, I've got, two min I got one minute to go that way. <laughs> well, it goes one minute that way. Am I, am I going to be far enough? Uh, I, I think they're pretty convinced that they would be by that, by that point. It was part of the reason they were up there pretty, pretty high. So anyway, so I got sidetracked there on there. But you're right. This is that physical picture. Without air friction, they move at that same horizontal speed. So the mouse is directly below it as, it as it goes down. Now continuing with this physical picture, then it says after two seconds, the hawk then turns and dives at a straight line to catch its prey. Catching its prey right here 
which they describe as three meters above the ground. So after two seconds, the mouse is here and Hawk is here. Okay. Then it dives, and so it's going to need to match up. Uh, it's not straight down. Well, there's a good question. What does it look like from you? What does it look like from the hawk? I mean, the hawk sees the mouse where? Right below it. So the hawk's going to go what it would think, if you will, is straight down. But it's actually, as it goes straight down, is keeping its horizontal speed. Right? So from our viewpoint, we're watching the hawk go straight down with a horizontal speed. So the hawk does that, and then as it goes down, it keeps its horizontal speed. So this is where the hawk catches it. And that, that's our problem. Although, again, every time I read this problem, I can't think about what's going to happen next. <laughs> I'm thinking this hawk is going nose into the ground. I mean, it's probably going pretty fast. It just dove 197 meters. It's three meters off the ground. Good luck turning in time, but... For the sake of the hawk, I hope it does, all right? <laughs> but, uh, well, I, I see that. <laughs> Splat. But, you know, okay, well. But that's not part of our problem, I guess. That's part C, okay? All right, so, anyways, like I said, number of corny stories, but real important. You stop, you think about that physical picture. What is going on? It will help you whether you draw the line straight down at an angle. Do you draw it with a parabola as we have drawn here? Or do you draw a straight line as we've done there? And so once you make all those decisions, you can stand back and look at the problem and not go down the wrong road, hopefully. The bird would be a straight line, right? That is a straight line. Oh. <laughs> That's supposed to be a straight line. Yeah, yeah. It's about as straight as my bird is a bird. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, that is supposed to be a straight line. All right. So back to this here. It says A, assuming no air resistance acts on the mouse, find the diving speed of the hawk. B, what angle does the hawk make with the horizontal during its descent? And then C, how long did the mouse, and I'm glad they put it in quotes, enjoy its free fall? <laughs> Got to be a tough spot to be too. Do I hope to die and fall onto the ground or do I hope to be eaten by the hawk because it catches me? Uh, I'm not sure which I would hope for there. <laughs> uh, hopefully it's not a choice I, I'll have to make here. All right. I'll actually start with C. I think C is probably an easier question as you kind of look there. Because C has nothing to do with the movement of the hawk. The other ones have to do with the movement of the hawk. But the movement of the hawk has to do with where the mouse is. So I'm going to start with, with C. You may not agree. I'm not going to say that there is only one way to a attack a, a problem here. Um, but just kind of reading it, just kind of looking at what, what they're asking, the time it takes to drop, that has nothing to do with the other object. It has nothing to even to do with horizontal motion. So I kind of like that one. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start there. And if you see that, I think you'll make the problem a little easier on yourself. Maybe not. All depends on what you, you see first here. But if I were then writing out the equation for the vertical motion, I guess I would first stop and ask, is this a constant acceleration problem? Yes, yes right? It's a projectile. It's a free fall. What is acceleration in the vertical direction? Okay, it's 9.8 and it's down, if we want to call that negative or not, let's talk about it. But it's definitely 9.8 and it's definitely down. What's the acceleration horizontally? Zero. Zero, right? Okay, so we know it is a constant acceleration. And so I'm going to use that equation for the vertical motion because I do have constant acceleration. Now, as I go to apply this equation, as you said, plus or minus, I need to choose a coordinate system. So help me out here. I'll do it in orange here, but should... I do down positive, up positive, where should I put the origin? I mean, what do you want to do here? Okay, 
So I hear a bunch of people saying, call down positive. And I think that's the first time we've done that this, this semester. And so maybe it's about time we start doing it. You're starting to see the, the advantage of it. So, all right, I will call down positive. Where do you want to call zero? <coughs> right here? Okay, so right here, we will put the origin. I will label it with a positive y pointing down. And then we will still have the to the right positive x, okay. So I'll keep the x positive to the right, but now call down positive. And I'll put the origin right there when the, uh, where they uh, break free. So that'll be time equal to zero also, right? So it's the origin x, y, but it's also the origin for time. It's when it breaks free, that's time equals to zero. And as simple as that sounds, you need to consciously make that decision so you know what values to put in over here. So when I come over to here and I go to solve it, What's the final position of the mouse? Oh, well, good. I hear a 3, I hear a negative 3, I hear 197, I hear a negative 197. All right? And all of those could be, depending on where, you, where and how you put your coordinate system, but according to our coordinate system, down is positive, zero is here, we would have to go down 197. So it is a positive 197 meters. Fair enough? That's where it is. Using our coordinate system. Like I said, you don't have to pick it there. But you will have to be consistent for every term in there to get it to work out right, okay? So if you pick that one, that's what you'll get. And here was the advantage of picking that one. What's the initial position? Zero. So I'm sure that's why many of you said, hey, let's pick that as the origin. That's, that's the ad ad advantage there. But you pick any other origin, the difference between these two will come out to be the same difference no matter what origin you, you pick. The or so keep that in, in, that in mind. Uh, how about this? What's the initial velocity in the y direction? Okay, good. You see that in the physical picture. It's, it's, it's zero. It's, it's moving horizontally when it works itself free. So it does have a horizontal speed, but the, uh, and, and, and they might even mention the horizontal, yeah, I didn't put it up here, but the first part of the sentence here says that the hawk was flying horizontally at 10 meters per second. So we do know that horizontal speed, but that doesn't help us for this problem. We need to know that zero is our vertical speed. And then what's our acceleration? Positive or negative? 9.8, yeah, positive 9.8. So there's a positive 9.8. And there's my units, meters per second squared. And so that's what I was saying about, I think uh, C will be an easier problem to do first because it only has vertical motion. Vertical motion gives us time, we know all those. And so here's just one equation and we can solve this. So taking 197 and multiplying it by two, dividing that by 9.8, taking the square root, gives me about 6.34 seconds. So 6.34 seconds is that time frame of it falling down as, you know, it says. How long did it enjoy this, this free fall? So just over six seconds. So now I'll come back and try to answer these other ones. Uh, for example, B says, what angle did it make with the horizontal? So looking at this picture, that would be the angle they're talking about. So what is the, the diving angle? And again, maybe this is a judgment call. I think that's going to be easier to solve than the first one. So maybe I'll just go in reverse and do B before A. Because A says, what is the hawk's diving speed? Now, to get speed, I probably need to know this distance, but to get that distance, I probably need to know that angle. So I'm thinking distance first, then speed. So distance and angles usually come first. Maybe not. You never know until you give it a try. And that's what I was saying about problem solving, you know. Don't, don't get the impression that uh, just because you don't know where to go, that you can't solve it. You, you solving a maze. You, you try it. Go down a path. Good chance it's not the right path, but it, what it'll do is give you information about what not to do or where to go next. So you gotta try all these things. It's like, like I said, solving a puzzle. You pick up a puzzle piece, you look at it. 
Chances are you're not going to have the one that matches. But there's a good chance it's going to help you. It's going to say, hmm, this has got some blue in it. I'm going to set it over there. Because these other ones got blue in them. And you toss them all together over there. You know, and you, and you start looking at what works and what doesn't work here. So in my case, I'm going to try B. You might have tried A first. That's fine. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. But if you can't solve all A all the way, you'll come and try something else, right? And I suspect that A and B, you know, really need time. So if you tried to do A and B, you would realize along the way, I got to do time. And then by the time you got to C, you go, well, I already did that. <laughs> I, I did that to answer A. Exactly. All right, well, so let's try B. B is this dive angle. And uh, this one stands out to me as being the next one to do. Because if I make a triangle here, I can get an angle if I know any two sides of the triangle, right? And we just did this one. I know that one. <laughs> right? That's 197. And this one here doesn't look too bad to me. I'm going to need to give it some thought. But isn't this the horizontal speed, which it keeps the same way? So isn't this going 10 meters every second? So if it was two seconds before we started to take the dive, and the total time was 6.34 seconds, isn't this motion right here 4.34 seconds of motion? And so then, isn't distance in the x direction equal to initial velocity in the x direction times time? And the, the velocity is 10, and the time is 4.34 seconds. So I'm thinking this is 43.4 meters, yeah. And so that's why I picked B first. I was kind of going, you know, I can already know vertical distance, and horizontal is going to be real easy. It's just 10 multiplied by time, and I just did time. So that's why it kind of stood out to me as being the appropriate one to do first. So now that I know vertical distance and horizontal distance, I can now answer their question about the angle. And I would write it as tangent of theta. So tangent of theta would be the opposite, 197, over the adjacent, 43.4. And then I can solve for the angle. So inverse tangent of 197 over the 43.4 coming out to be about 77.6 degrees. 77.6 degrees. So there would be the dive angle. Yeah? How do we know the horizontal velocity was still in your second? Uh, um, let me rephrase that. I know that the mouse's horizontal speed. So if the mouse is directly here, the mouse will move that far. How's that? Yeah. Uh, how long did it take for the mouse to fall to here? How long did it take for the bird to go to here? Subtract the two, you're in four seconds. Right. right. All right. So there's our, our time. So again, this particular one, you know, is, you know, time is what we call the independent variable. Everything marches with time. The X motion, the Y motion, all things are happening as the clock is running, as time is, is going along. Which will allow me now to do this last part of the question, C or A, going in reverse order here, is what is the speed? Now, they were nice to me and said it's going to be a constant speed. So I can just do the whole distance divided by the whole time, right? So I will say the speed, and I'll put the little dive here for the diving speed, will be the whole distance divided by the whole time. And I'll start with the time. That's, that's the part we worked out from here. It's 4.34 seconds to do the, the, to do the dive. Right? So I know the time by subtracting the 6 from the, the 2 and getting the 4 seconds for the dive. What's the distance it travels? It's a Pythagorean theorem again. We just did the horizontal and vertical. So 
it's got to be a horizontal distance of 43.4 squared and a vertical distance of 197 and I'll square it and take the square root. So there's distance, there's time, divide the two. Okay, and so using our two-dimensional motion, our Pythagorean's theorem here. So 43.4 squared plus 197 squared equals square root of all of that gives me a distance of about 202 meters. And then 4.34 seconds coming out to be about 40 6.5, 46.5 meters per second. And so that would be its speed. And now I can answer yours a little bit. I can go back and get horizontal speed and see if it matches or not. But, but, but it, really the mouse's horizontal speed was my, my logic point, yeah. Yeah, now if it said find the velocity, um, then, you know, I'm going to draw a little arrowhead, and then I can break it to its x and y components, and depends which angle you want to put here, but since I know this one from part B at 77.6, Point six degrees, then if it had said find its velocity vector and they wanted it in the x component and the y component, I guess I would take its magnitude of 46.5 meters per second, which that's like 100 miles an hour. Three meters above the ground. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but then, as you said, I would go cosine of the 77.6 i-hat. Plus or minus? minus? Yeah, good. It is down, which my first reaction is negative, but what did we call for this one? Positive, yeah. So this is going to be a positive. 46.5 sine of 77.6 degrees J hat. Yeah. Well, let's try one more here. And then we'll move into some stuff that you've, you've seen before. Uh, but stuff that I just kind of want to dig up those memory cells. Uh, not so much disturb your studying for the test, but just bring up Newton's three laws of motion to, so that they will be ready to move on after we, we, we take the test here. Okay, But this next one, 50, 59, is... Well, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. I'm, I'm hoping you're beginning to see that they look the same, that the details change because you, you know, you've got different problems. You've got two objects or one object. They fall and turn, you know, and there's all kinds of different things that can go on. But uh, hopefully you're just seeing it's the same set of equations again and again and again. Same type of logic again and again and again. And this one is a good illustration of that. Here it says a skier leaves a ramp of a ski jump with a velocity of 10 meters per second at an angle of 15 degrees above the horizontal as shown in the picture. So if you don't have the book, the picture looks something like this. It's got this ramp, oh I shouldn't use the word ramp, uh, what do they call this? Well, they do call it a ramp, but we're also going to have a landing ramp. Uh, so this is the jumping ramp, okay? So we've got a jumping ramp that comes down, and if you've ever seen the uh, ski jumps, they kind of arch up, right? And the whole idea is to jump and see how far you get. That's how you get the gold medal, right? So if this is Winter Olympics, the idea is how far are you going to jump? And so they've got this skier here coming down, looks like a bobsled, but it's coming down 
and right here it gets launched okay and that's what that picture is saying so uh, that first sentence a skier leaves the ramp of a ski jump with a velocity of 10 meters per second at 15 degrees so this is 10 meters per second the angle it's 15 degrees, not really drawn to scale. That's a much bigger angle than 15 degrees. But so you can see it really well. I want to emphasize. Here's the, the jump part of it. The second sentence says, the slope, the landing ramp, is sloped at an incline of 50 degrees. In other words, coming down from the launch point is a landing ramp and the landing ramp makes an angle of 50 degrees and so the jump looks something like this you come off and you land onto the ramp okay fair enough nice little parabola now this says it go ahead and ignore air resistance which makes a good classroom problem I'm not a realistic problem and if you've ever watched the ski jumpers it's, it's quite impressive of you know who jumps the the furthest and you know how they kind of bend over and they kind of catch the air so they got their hands back here and they arc their back and they look like a little airfoil they're going through and I guess that's the whole point oh and they tip their skis you know and they're trying to catch the air and ride the air as as far as they can uh, but not doing any of that we're just going to have a projectile and say we're going to land down here on the ramp somewhere okay and I think that's the question here it is find a the distance from the ramp, the jump ramp, to the place where the jumper lands. B, the velocity components just before landing. Okay, and I'll even add another one in there. Maybe we should find the angle between the jumper landing and the ramp here. I'll call that C. They don't ask for it. But I'll well, start with that first part. It's, it's D. What is the distance it lands? Let me put it in the picture. So what are they looking for? And so it's kind of important we make sure we got the right, you know, question in mind here. Of course, also it's important we got the good physical picture. So maybe I should have paused there like I've done my other one. Got a good physical picture of, of what's going on? We launch. We saw one like this on Monday. We had that, those uh, watermelons that fell off the truck and rolled off and went splat down on the bank. It looks familiar? Okay. And hopefully you're going to say, well, this is the same problem. Good. You know, if you do, then you could do any problem like this, right? The, the, the uh, watermelon rolled straight off. This one had an angle. So I think it's a little bit harder. Although, that one, the bank was in the shape of a parabola. Whereas this is in the shape of a straight line. And I think that's a little easier, straight lines, than, than the parabola. So, you know, it's probably about that, that same level. But the fact that it goes up a little bit at first, I think makes it a little bit harder than the watermelon one. Which is why in my list, I put it last here. And I said, okay, if this, if this one makes sense, then you, you're ready for the test. I shouldn't say makes sense, because it, it has to not only make sense, but it has to be you could do it without my help type thing, right? You, could you do this on your own? Now, did it make sense that I did it, but could, could you do it? So back to the question. The question is, find A, the distance from the ramp to the place where the jumper lands. Okay? So that's it in the picture. They're looking for D. They're not looking for a horizontal distance or a vertical, but it's both of those, right? It's both of those together. All right, so got a good physical picture of what's going on and what they're asking for? Okay, because that next part is coordinate system. We'll do that in orange. You know, where do you want to put your origin? What do you want to call positive? What do you want to call negative? I see some, some of you saying, let's put the origin where they jump. And uh, great, I like that. 
Not, not to say you have to do it that way, but we've been doing it all along and most of the time it, it's best there. So we'll stick to that one. Here brings up an interesting question though. Which do you want to call positive and negative? <laughs> yeah, you know, since it does go up and then down, we're going to have positives and negatives no matter what we do. So my reaction, sounds like most of yours, is stick to the traditional one. You know, less chance of getting confused there. Let's call up positive and work on it from there. All right, so, so if we do, then we will call up positive and to the right positive. So there's my positive X and my positive Y. And so even though last time we switched it and it was the first time, I don't think there's any point in switching it here. We've got both positives and negatives, so we'll keep it at the tradition. All right, so I've got the origin, got my coordinate system, got a good physical picture. Is this a constant acceleration problem? Yeah, at least certainly from once they leave the ramp here. It's a projectile, right? And so the acceleration is? Okay, in the vertical direction, negative 9.8. In the horizontal direction? Zero, right. And so we can use our kinematic equation. So if I were starting to write out these equations, I guess they would look something like this. I would say, okay, here's that, that ski jumper. Uh, x would equal to initial x plus initial velocity x times time plus one half acceleration x times squared. Whereas the equation for the vertical motion would be y initial plus initial velocity y times time plus one half y times squared. Okay? And so I think you're seeing this idea. That's the fundamental idea of constant acceleration. Apply this scenario to those equations. So I apply this, I would have initial position zero, right? What's initial velocity in the x direction? Don't forget the cosine, right? It is 10 cosine 15. Then I got my t. What's the acceleration? Zero. So by the time I put all those in, my first equation comes down to this. And maybe I'll even go one more step and just put the 10 together with the cosine of 15. So 10 times cosine of 15 is a, mm, 966. So 9.66t is my first relationship. And so this tells me, you know, where in the horizontal direction is the jumper as a function of time. One second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. Unfortunately, that doesn't really tell me where it lands. So I got a little more work to do here. Uh, but that's as far as I can go with the x motion. And I can do the same thing with the y motion. Let's put in those numbers. What's the initial position? Zero. What's the initial velocity? Okay, so it's the 10 and then it's the sine of 15 times t. Uh, what's the acceleration? Yeah, negative 9.8. And so there would be my equation for the y motion. And I'll simplify this one too. 10 times sine of 15 is 2.59, so 2.59t minus 4.9t squared. And I'll put a little dotted line around that one. So there are my two equations describing the two positions, the x position and the y position, as a, as a function of time. Okay? But again, why this is a harder problem, but just like the watermelon, how many unknowns do I have? It's three, right? When this thing comes to a land right here, do I know the x position? No. Do I know the y position? Do I know how much time it took? No, those are my three unknowns up here. I don't know where it lands, x or y, and I don't know how much time it took. And I only have two equations. So before I start doing hours of trying to solve this, hopefully you realize that. I, I need some more information, don't I? So what's my next piece of information? 
Right, and just like we had for the parabola, except in that one they gave you the equation for the parabola, this one they don't. So you're going to have to get the equation for that slope. When, and so what you're really saying is when does this parabola cross this line, right? And so if I put these two together, I will have the equation of a parabola. And when does that parabola cross this line? All right, so why don't I make the equation for that line? So how do I make the equation for a line? Well, there's our little equation we learned in algebra or pre-algebra, equation for a line. Y equals mx plus b, right? So applied to this case, what's b? Zero, right? B is that, that intercept. So this is the part where, you know, the applied mathematics. Go back and read the math. What does B mean? B means where does it cross the y-axis? Look how you set it up. You set it up so that this was the origin. Now, you may not have realized it, but that was really the, probably the most useful uh, decision of why you would put the origin right there. Not just the nice part that it gave us initial position equals zero, but it's going to give us an easier equation for a line. We have no intercept. And... Uh, I don't know if you looked that far ahead. Uh, probably not. Uh, I wouldn't expect it. But if you did, that, that's a good reason to pick the origin right there. Real strong reason. Uh, how about the slope? What's the slope here? So slope. Yeah, and here's some of you working it out. Isn't slope rise over run? So you see the next step? What is it? Divide the y um, equation by the x equation. Do you see it here? Rise? Run? Rise over run is tangent of that angle? Mm -hmm. All right, so put your trig together with your algebra. Isn't this just tangent of 50? So there's a slope, tangent of 50. Yeah, I am missing one thing. Some of you see it. What am I missing here? Negative slope, isn't it? All right, so that completes it. This, this is a slope of negative tangent 50 degrees x is equal to y. So there's my equation. Okay? And so, again, I think it makes a good problem because of that. They didn't give you the equation this time. They want you to think about what did you learn in your math classes? How can you take that and apply it to the physical world here? And so the slope, the tangent, the negative of the tangent, right? Now I'll simplify it a little by actually calculating the tangent of 50 degrees, which is about a 1.19. So this says y equals negative 1.19x, and I'll put a dotted line around that. So there's the equation for the landing ramp. This is the equation of the projectile, the skier. If we solve that for time and put it into here, we would have the equation of the parabola. And so, why don't I do that? It, and this certainly isn't the only way to solve it, but since we are trying to find x and y, I'm just going to eliminate time from this and say if I put those two together, I would have y equals 2.59 multiplied by t. But t is x over 9.66 and then minus 4.9 times t which would be x squared over 9.66 squared. And that's probably worth simplifying. So 2.59 in the numerator divided by 9.66 comes out to be 0.268x there. And then this one, 4.9 divided by 9.66 
squared comes out to be 0, 5 to 5x squared. Okay. And so there's my equation for that parabola. So you're really saying, when does this parabola <laughs> cross that line, right? And so now that I have taken two equations and put them together, and of course have limited, eliminated one unknown, so there's no time, I can then put these two equations together and eliminate another unknown. And then I would have one equation and one unknown. Uh, so, I think probably the easiest one is the, is the y here. We can put the y here with the y there. So, negative 1.19x is equal to 0.268x minus 0.0525x squared. And now, solve for x. If I move this to the other side, I get a plus 0.0525x squared. And if I move this to the other side, it becomes a plus. And when I add it, um, 8, 6, and 9 make 15. So carry 1, 3, 4.1x. Added that right, right? And so there's my equation that has the x's in it. And even though it has a square one, fortunately I don't have to do a quadratic here, um, because I can get rid of an x on each side. And we had did this one before. How do you get rid of x on each side? Well, you divide by x, except if x is 0, right? And if x is 0, then we might be getting rid of a solution. So we better check. Does x equal to 0? Would that be a solution? Well, x equals to 0 would give y equals to 0, which would give time equals to 0. So is it a solution? Yes. But do I care about that one? No. Does this parabola cross at 0, 0 at time 0? Absolutely. That's the taking off part. So ignoring that one, we can most show that the other one would be this. So that makes 0 0.0525x equaling 1.458 and now I can solve for x. And so 1.458 divided by 0 0.0525 and 27.8 meters is what I get for x. Once I get x, I can put it into any of these equations. This one looks like the easiest one there. So I will go times a negative 1.19 and come up with a negative 33.0 meters. And I don't think they asked for time, but why not? Let's get it here. We can take our x, 27.8 and divide it by 9.66 and come up with 2.88 seconds. And so there, if we've done our math right, is a solution to these equations. And if we did our equations right, then it's a solution to the physics. So again, those two big pieces. Get the equations for the physics. If those are right, then solve the math. And if those are right, you get the whole problem right. You get both the physics and the math right. Now, I guess I'm not done because I only have x and y. That's not what they asked. What are they asking? Yeah, what is d here? What is that distance? So, I've got the x and y, but I really want to know total d. But I think you can see it now. d is what? Yeah, we got to do the Pythagorean theorem here. We got to take how far in the x squared, how far in the y squared, add them together, and take their square root. So Pythagorean's theorem here. The sum of the square of the legs equals the square of the hypotenuse. So the 27.8 squared plus the 33 squared equal and square root of all of that is about 43.1.
So now we can answer A, what is the distance down the ramp? 43.1. And I guess we kind of live in the wrong part of the country or world to know if that's a good jump or not. Anybody know? <laughs> I think there's two ski jumps, right? There's the, the long one, and I think the long one they go 100 meters plus. So I think this is not Olympic quality there. But but I think the short one this might be. I'm not I'm not sure here. So I'm not sure how what an Olympic jump is on the uh, short ramp. Maybe it'll give me something to do over the the long weekend. So while you guys are studying Monday, I will. Surf the web and see if I can find the uh, <laughs> the different ski jumps and get their d dimensions there. So, in fact, I was just thinking about because it's supposed to get some snow up in the mountains, and I just for some reason I was going through my mind this morning. I don't think I've seen snow in ten years. I'm like, oh, you know, about time I go see some snow. <laughs> All right. Well, not quite done. There's a bee here. B says, what is the vertical component just before landing? So there's a fun question, but you know, basically it's coming down to how fast is it going? So let me leave this on the board, but the time is going to become real important now in to figure out my, my vertical components here. I'll start with the velocity in the x direction. Well, since it is a constant acceleration, you already told me, there would be kinematic equation number one. And the horizontal speed never changes. And we get that from the fact that you can just put plus zero there, zero acceleration. So this is initial velocity times the cosine of the launch angle. So in this case, it's 10 meters per second times the cosine of 15 degrees. And I think that's the 966 that we had already done somewhere. I think it's the part I just erased. But that is the horizontal speed. We've done it once before. I'll do it again just to double check. Yeah, 966. So there is the horizontal speed. So there would be part of the question, what's the horizontal speed? And the vertical speed when it lands will change. I mean, this is what it starts off. But since there is a time factor, it's going to first slow down in the vertical direction. That's why it gets to its highest point. Then it's going to speed up as it is dropping down. And so we'll want to know how much time that took. And so velocity in the y direction is initial velocity plus acceleration in the y times time. The initial velocity is the 10 sine of 15. The acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared in the downward direction. And the time is what we would need to have known if we hadn't already done it. But I figured this was coming. We needed to get the time here. And so we could put these two together. And I think that's the number we had before, 2.5 something. I won't even try to remember it. I'll just do it again. So 10 times sine of 15, then minus 9.8 times 2.88, coming up with a negative 25.6 meters per second. By the way, you might recall the first day I said, this class is going to be pretty analytical. Fair enough? Done a lot of math? Yeah, and so this is the class that uh, we go from our Physics 102, where, hey, here's the concepts. The concepts led to the equation. Now we're trying to take that next step. Now solve those equations. Put those equations together and uh, solve it. So there's the uh, velocity components. And we can write those with an I hat or J hat as somebody said there. So okay, fair enough. But I want to ask one more question. It's not in the book, but how about C? What's the angle then between the jumper and the ramp as they come together? Because you can imagine there's going to be a little bit of, a, of an impact. 
And I think you would probably agree here that probably the, the smaller this angle, the, the, the less the impact. So it's kind of nice to come down at, at an angle as opposed to, you know, if, well, with flat ground, you just come down and go boom, you know, then your, your feet got to stop all that. So you're going to come in here and say, what's my, my angle? And so in this picture, I have something that looks like this, right? And so there's the velocity vector of it. Uh, looking at those numbers, that picture's kind of off a little bit. It probably looks more like this. Uh, here's the ramp. And they're showing it at, oh, about 10 this way and 2.5 that way. So almost looks like the velocity vector is more like that. Okay. So why don't I go ahead and do this? Why don't I just draw a horizontal line and why don't we find this angle right there? Why don't we find the angle between a horizontal line and the velocity vector? I'll call it theta for right now. But that says then theta, or maybe I should put tangent of theta. Tangent of theta would be the opposite piece, so that's the vertical speed. And I'm just going to put it in as a positive number. I already know the angle's down, so I'll just put a positive 25 over the adjacent piece, which is the 9.66. So the angle that this skier is making through the air is inverse tangent of 25.6 divided by 9.66 coming up to be 69.3 degrees. Is that, is that, uh, or I'm, I'm just making this up. Just to it's, they gave part A and B. Part A was what's the distance. Part B was what's the velocity component. Part C they don't have, but part C would be nice to say, well, what angle does the skier come in? Kind of like I did with the coyote. What angle was the coyote hitting the floor? And they, uh, they didn't have a part D for the coyote one, and this didn't have a part C. But it's just this next step here. So now what I know is this angle is 50. This larger angle I just solved for 69. This angle here would also be 50 because I would have two parallel lines and a transit. So these are alternate interior angles. So the angle between the impact is the difference between those two angles. And so I guess we have, you know, a, from the skier's point of view, it's coming in at an angle of about 20 degrees here. So it's not much of an angle, which is, which is good. That's kind of what you need is that's the whole advantage of the landing ramp is that you will come in at an angle and so you can land with that down here. So 19.3, I'll change colors, then is going to be this angle right here. It's the angle between the direction the skier is headed, the velocity vector, 69.3 down, and the direction of the landing ramp, 50 degrees. So when you subtract the two, that's the angle between them. Kind of tells you how the skier hits the, the ramp. So this would be 90 degrees. I jump and go you know, straight in. That's 90 degrees between me and the, the ground. And it's easier to land the smaller that angle is. So the answer would be 19.3 for what is the angle between the direction of the skier and the slope, the, the, the landing slope, the landing ramp. Okay, well, those did take a, even a little bit more time than I had hoped, but, but, I, but I think better. I, if I wanted to spend any additional time, and based on your questions or look on your faces, I, you know, go the direction that, I, that I'm hoping. and. Will, will, will be the most most helpful and at some point if I spend too much time on it then it's not more helpful 
on the other end of it when we get to the next chapter here. So, thought I, I'd add about 20 minutes to it and say, okay, so, granted it was more than the first half hour, but let's look now at chapter 5. Let me give you a, a, a quick look at, at chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5 uh, could even help you here in chapter 4, because don't be surprised that if you can do 5, you could probably do 4. See how this game is being played? And you're going to have to know how to do four before you can do five. And you're going to have to know how to do five before you can do six. And you need to do six before you can do seven. Well, maybe not so much that chapter, as you'll see. We <laughs> kind of take a different angle approach there. All right. But these do build on each other. And so the, it's like climbing a ladder. You go to, from one rung to another to another to another. You know, and just about the time you think, I got it, guess what happens? Yeah, there's another rung, and hopefully the ladder won't break on you, but it's one step further. But I will tell you this, this, this is kind of the start of the place where some students don't make the rung of chapter 4 or chapter 5, and then they're lost in chapter 6, because you can't reach 6 if you can't reach 5. And you can't reach five if you, if, you, if you don't reach four. So your job right now is to focus on four. Can you get to rung number four? Can I get to chapter number four? Because this next chapter, chapter five, builds on, of course, what we've done so far. Um, and when I say builds on what we've done so far, of course, I mean chapter four. But I guess I also mean the rest of your other experience in life, which including your math experience and your science experience. And so that's what I've said many times. And you're going to see it right now. Because I don't want to give you anything new right before the test. I want to talk a little bit about chapter five, but, but really not give you anything new. Now, for the first time, we change from just describing the motion. Isn't that what we kind of just did with all these problems? We described it. We said, where's it going to land? What angle is it? How fast is it going? We never said, well, why does it have an acceleration of 9.8? Well, to describe motion, you're probably familiar with Newton's three laws of motion. And so I know you learned that in the Physics 102 or whatever physics class you had taken or when and wherever you took it. You learned Newton's three laws of motion. And so I'm going to say the same thing. Let's take Newton's three laws of motion. Let's take the calculus that you learned in Math 150. Let's also take the vector mathematics that you just learned in Chapter 3 and applying in Chapter 4 and put them all together in this chapter. Now, I'm not going to try to put them all together in a half hour, so I'm not going to worry about them today. But what I do want to do today is just say, let's look at Newton's three laws of motion. Do you remember Newton's three laws of motion? And so I'll just say here, Newton's three laws of motion. And the biggest picture of all of this is to remember, can all motion be explained with Newton's three laws of motion? Yes. Uh, there are some limitations that we haven't mentioned, and we will mention them starting this chapter, but not today. But we didn't mention them in 102. So, so we're building our, our knowledge, but as far as most of the things on the Earth, Newton's three laws match. Most of the things in the whole universe, with the exception of a few case. And so, we'll talk more about that, but let's just start with the, the basic. Newton's three laws. Anybody remember number one? Yeah, good. We, we, we gave it a name. We called it here, number one, the law of inertia. Good. I heard somebody say inertia. In fact, maybe I should just ask, what does the word inertia mean? It's not a very common word today. Okay, resistance to change. Right. That, that's kind of what I have to. So, when you say something has inertia, it has its resistance to change. And Newton's first law is, as many of you said, means what? If an object's at rest, it wants to? Stay at rest. It doesn't want to start moving, right? Because that would be a change. But what if it's already moving? An object that's already moving will? Will want to stay moving. With the same speed, in the same direction. Okay? 
It's where they want to do. So we like to say it this way. An object at rest wants to remain at rest. An object in motion wants to remain in motion with a constant speed and constant direction unless acted upon by yeah, some kind of outside force. In 102 we call it unbalanced force. In this class we'll call it net force. Okay, But let me start right there because you probably recognize that this over here. Some of you did anyway because you probably saw this in the 102. If you had the 102 with me, you saw this. This is a good example of Newton's first law of motion. I have objects at rest. Well, these are moving. But that's at rest. But I'll start with these. These are at rest. These objects are at rest. So according to Newton's first law, just to kind of jog your mind, objects at rest want to stay at rest. So could I pull this piece of paper out from under these dishes? And it's for a good example of Newton's first law. The first law is saying they're at rest and they want to remain at rest. For them to move, I've got to push on them. I've got to pull on them. I've got to apply a, a force on them. And I have gotten some paper that is this butcher paper that it's pretty slick, it's pretty smooth. Because when things rub, is there a force between them? Sure, we call that friction. Good. So all this coming back from your memory, yeah, good. And so there would be some friction there. So there's going to be a little bit, but not much. And I'm hoping there will be so little that it will be like no force. And if there's no force, they stay at rest. Shall I give it a try? Should I warn you guys down there? <laughs> hate to send someone to the hospital again. All right. One, <laughs> two, three. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So they are at rest. And they remain at, at, at rest. And, and as neat as it is to watch it, it's not really that hard. Nice slick piece of paper, pull it out. Or a silk tablecloth, which I can't afford, so you know, we do the paper here. You know, it just slides out from underneath it. So objects at rest re remain at rest. Here's another fun one for those of you who might not have seen it. Many of you saw it in the 102. If I take this string with my hand, which of course is tied to this weight, which is then tied to this post up here, and I pull on it, so I'm going to pull down, and I'm going to keep pulling and keep pulling until the string breaks. Will the string down at the bottom break first? Or will the string at the top break first? Which one breaks? So, they are the same string, for those of you who are saying, oh, no, they, 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 no, they're the same string, and assuming they've been manufactured well, they all have the same strength. So that's, that's not the issue here. Who thinks the bottom one's going to break? Who thinks the top one's going to break? And the answer is, if you pull it fast, the bottom won't break. Pull it harder and harder, but in a slow fashion the top one will break. So, if you got some free time, want to make some money off your friends, you know, <laughs> bet with them for a minute. And you can always win because you control how fast you, you pull it. But why then <laughs> did it break in, in that way? Why did the bottom one break when I gave it a quick jerk? Yeah, it's this law of inertia that I'm trying to bring back to you. Right? An object at rest wants to remain at rest. And so this one is at rest and as I give it a quick jerk essentially what's happening is I am pulling on this string and it is stretching the string and stretching the string. Meanwhile this one hasn't had a time to move. It has inertia. So that quick jerk is a good illustration of inertia. Those of you who said the top one would break probably were thinking that because the top one's got to support the tug of my hand and this heavy weight, right? But I'm trying to say only if I give it time for the object to move. So the quick jerk, the inertia here, stops or reduces the movement of this and the, the tension, if you will, the tug, if you will, never gets to this top one and so the bottom one breaks away. It's really no different than you guys have probably done this with a paper towel roll many times, right? You take the paper towel and how do you get one sheet off when you only have one hand? You do a quick 
pull on it, right? You, you are using the properties of inertia of the thick paper towel roll to go ahead and then pull the one away from it before the other one can get a chance to unwind. And maybe you've even noticed the reverse of this. What if you are towards the end of the paper roll? And you go to do a quick jerk and there's only like five sheets left on it. <laughs> yeah, you don't have that inertia. And so when you do a quick pull, it quickly unwinds. And you just end up with five sheets coming off the end of the uh, paper towel roll. And so that inertia effect. And in between you'll notice it. When you put a first or a new roll on there with all those sheets, it doesn't take much to pull it off. Then you get down to the middle of the sheet and <laughs> takes a little quicker jerk. You get down to a quarter of the roll and it gets harder and harder each time. You have less and less inertia. Well, okay, and then of course as it goes to tear, it's going to tear at the weakest point, so that's why you don't tear a sheet in half, usually. Sometimes you do, but, but usually it will then tears at those perforations. So, that, yeah, so, so it, it, yeah, but, but it would still tear, you know, the idea would still, if there weren't perforations in there, I bet a new sheet, you could pull it fast enough that you would then tear the paper itself. You just don't know where it's going to tear, because it's going to tear at the weakest point, so. Huh? <laughs> Third derivative of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there's the law of inertia. Now let me try the other side of this. The other side of this is one that maybe is a little bit hard to, um, to imagine. I'm hoping not at this point in your education, because you've seen me do this before here. But it was something that uh, uh, was a little bit of a challenge for Newton to explain and convince other people. Because they often did this. Okay, here's an object in motion, right? I mean, at least once my hand lets go of it. It's in motion. And then what happens? It stops. But I thought we said the first law, the law of inertia said not only objects at rest remain at rest, but objects in motion continue in motion. Did that continue in motion? Because no. Because of the friction of the, of the table. So the idea that this comes to a stop for no reason is wrong. It does come to a stop, but there is a reason for it, right? There is a force on it. There's friction. So you can kind of see it well here with this little cart. This cart is on wheels and they're on really good wheels. Uh, they're still spinning and for those of you who are close enough you can hear the, the wheels spinning and so there's some good bearings here and so if you give an object a push it will keep going forever and ever and ever and ever. It won't do this way because there's a force on it, but it will this way because there is no force on it. And so there is our Newton's first law. The other thing to say about Newton's first law, notice there's no math in it. So it's all physics and we're just going to look at things now. Because if you look at something and it say go slower, what does that tell you? Must have been some kind of forces on it, right? What we're going to call a net force. It must have, you know, got to be. What if it? What if it went? What I say? Faster, slower? Uh, what? Faster, slower, or turn? If it does any of those, what do you know? Force. Yeah, there's force on. It. But if it goes in a straight line, answer? No net force, right? If it's at rest and remains at rest, no net force on it. So I turned on the overhead. So I thought. So then we can take the, the second step here. And the second step is into Newton's second law. Did the doesn't look like it went. There we go. Okay. All right. And so taking the uh, computer here, let's look at some pictures. Let's look at Newton's second law. And so what I do with the red pen. Newton's second law is the one that you might recall from Physics 102 that's got a lot of math in it. I like to say this. I like to say Newton's second law picks up where the first one left off. Because remember the first one is telling us if you have a net force, what happens? Well, it will go faster or it will go slower or it will turn. In other words, it will accelerate. That's what the first law is saying. The first law is saying without a net force, there's no acceleration. So it's at rest, it remains at rest. 
It's in motion, it continues in motion in a straight line, right? But once you do have a force, you are saying then it will accelerate. So the next question is how much is that acceleration? And that's the equation we will use again and again and again and again and again. And in fact, would you like me to give you the answer to all the homework questions? Here it is. Newton's second law. Do you remember it? What does it say? Acceleration is? Force divided by mass. Yep. Where F then is the force. Now, it's a little more complicated than that, so we're going to have to add to this. I heard somebody else say it this way, and that's fine, that F equals MA, and that's fine. I, I kind of like this from a physics point of view. I like this from a math point of view. So, you'll, you'll write this out probably a lot when you're doing the equations, but this is nice because this is telling me why I have an acceleration. What are the two reasons I have an acceleration? Well, one is the force, the other is the mass, the inertia of the, of the object. So the same force on two different objects doesn't necessarily give you the same acceleration, right? So if I push with a force of 3 and a force of 3, do I get the same acceleration? No. So different things can happen here. It's a combination of the force. It's a combination of the mass. And it's actually more complicated than that. It's a combination of not just one force, but net force. What do you think we mean by net force here? Okay, total force. What do you mean by that? Combine all those forces together. And again, we did the same thing in 102. I, I drew pictures like this. Let me start again. What if I drew a picture with a little cart and I said, let's push on it with a force of three. Now, this begs the question, three what? We need some units here for this new quantity called force. And I'm hoping you kind of remember, like I said, I'm hoping that 90% of you know 95% of what I'm saying today. I'm not you know, trying to give you anything really too new, but getting you prepared for the new stuff after we take the, the test here. But what were the units for force? Newtons, right. So I should be saying three Newtons. Symbol for Newton. Capital N. Alright, now I think this is probably the easiest one of all. If I take a cart and I push on it with a force of three Newtons, what is its net force? Three Newtons, fair enough? Because, look at the next picture. What if I take a cart and one person pushes with three and another person pushes with four? Yeah, hopefully it's not a surprise. You are going to say, well, this would be the equivalent of, and that's what we mean by net force. Net force is the equivalent of it. Net force is this. The sum or the combination of all the forces added together give you the net force. Now that is some new notation that you have not seen. Does that mean anything to you? What does that mean? Remember that big sigma means what? Sum. Add them all together. And so you are you are taking the three, you are taking the four, you are putting them together, and you are saying that the net force is now seven. Is anybody pushing with seven? No. But what you are saying then is two forces together is the same as one force of seven. And now, notice there's an arrowhead over it. What does that mean? Yeah, we didn't have that in 102, right? That's that vector symbol. In other words, does 3 and 4 always make 7? No, let's change it up a little bit here. What if I had uh, a 3 this way and the second force was a 4 that way? What's the net force? Yeah, it's 1. You might even say a negative 1 and we'll, we'll go down the math road again after the test here. But you're right, it is a, a 1 here. So this is a good example of when I say, quote, add them, what I mean is add the 
vectors. And when you add two vectors, one of them being negative, you're really subtracting them, aren't you? And so we have to look at all the forces. We have to combine them together to get the net force. And unfortunately, whether we add or subtract, we've got to look at direction. These are vectors. We're going to be combining forces and vectors together. So now you can see why we did chapter 3, right? We need that really badly here in chapter 5. Of course, we also needed it in 4, but we've got to put them together. And I'm still doing the easy stuff here. What about a picture that looked like this? Three this way, whoops, sorry, and four perpendicular to that. Right, what is the net force? And now this class, I should say, what is the magnitude of the net force? Because now I would do this. I would say force number one is three newtons in the I hat direction. Force number two is negative four newtons in the J direction. What then is the net force? Just add the two vectors together. And if you get the magnitude, you've got to do the Pythagorean theorem. So here, the net force would be 3 newtons I hat minus 4 newtons J hat. Which then means the magnitude is 3 squared plus 4 squared square root, which many of you have already figured out was 5. And so the net force has a magnitude of 5. What direction is it? Yeah, and so we can do our inverse tangent. And that's something we did not do in Physics 102. We did not write them as vectors, I hats and J hats. We did not find the direction. We will now. And you can. If you look at this picture here, then, I would have a 3 this way and a 4 that way. That angle, then, would be the inverse tangent of 4 over 3. That would be the angle. And I'm pretty sure that's the 53.1 degrees of our standard 3, 4, 5 right triangle. Yeah, 53.1, okay? Not that I would expect you to have memorized it, but could you do it on your calculator? Could you tell me that angle? And now, and this is why I turned this on, could you do problems that we didn't even try to do in 102? Could you do, I should have started this, uh, Chapter 5. This problem. Oh, there we go. It starts off right at the beginning here and gives a problem with a hockey puck. Ah, uh, this one here. And says, here's a hockey puck. During a face-off, dropped on the ground, two hockey players hit it. They each hit it at the same time. This is their magnitude, this is the direction. What is the acceleration of this hockey puck? Can you do that one? Can you do the same physics in terms of net force, but applying our vectors to it? Shall we give it a try? That'll be a good place to stop. Can I get a net force here? give it a try. All right, so net force is force one plus force two, right? So looking at this picture, they say force one is this one right here. Force one is some angle here, okay, 20 degrees below some x-axis, however they define it. Maybe there's a, you know, a line in the ice there, and they go 20 degrees from uh, this center line or something, and the force happens to be 5 newtons. 
So, how would I get, say, the x component of force number one? I guess it would be 5 newtons, cosine of 20 degrees, I hat, right? Could I get the y component? Sure, that would be 5 newtons, sine, 20 degrees, in the negative j hat direction. Isn't that what this one is saying right here? And so, there is my components. Now, why am I bothering to get components anyways? I mean, one's five, one is eight. What, isn't that total 13? No, right? That's the whole idea of our vector addition. Five and eight don't make 13. The five and eight only make 13 when they're in the same direction here. And so, you saw that here, right? Three and four do not make seven. Sometimes they make five. Sometimes they make one. Sometimes they make something in between. And so now we have the tools to find out what is it in between. Get the total force. Get the direction from that force. So, in order to add vectors together, you have to put x's with x's and y's to y's. That's why we did the chapter 3. So then I would take my second force. Now my second force is a force of 8 and it's at 60 degrees according to this. So I guess I'd write it as 8 newtons cosine of 60 degrees in the i hat direction. And the vertical component of the second force would then be 8 newtons sine of 60 degrees j hat. And so to add them you put x's with x's. So putting 5 times cosine of 20 degrees together with 8 times cosine of 60 degrees, I get 8.70, 8.70 newtons in the i hat direction. And in the vertical direction, I would have a positive and a negative. Uh, maybe it'll be easier for me to do the positive first, 8 times the sine of 60 degrees minus 5 times sine of 20 degrees and that comes out to be a positive 5.22 newtons in the j direction. Okay, And so, like I said, take the physics 102 <laughs> net force and use our vectors. If I was drawing a picture, what would the net force look like here? Yeah, I guess it would come over here a little more than 8, almost 9, and up here about 5, and there's the net force. Could I get its magnitude? Yeah, what would its magnitude be? Yeah, 8.7 squared, and you guys see it, no problem, right? So you can do all of our vectors together with Newton's second law and this comes out to be a total of about 10.1 Newtons. And that's what we're after. What is the net force? It's 10. You put an 8, add it together to a 5 and you get a 10. Like, don't tell a 5th grader that. But that's what this comes out to be. What angle is it? Well, it's some angle theta, which is the inverse tangent of 5.22 over 8.7. Well, maybe I should stop there because I don't, you know, want to get too lost in the mathematics. That's going to happen after the test. I want you to focus on this, on this test here, here. But I, I think you can now see how we're going to put physics 102, our vectors math, our calculus together, and have a fun time here in chapter 5. Question.